Okay, I've got the thumbs up. So that means uh, we're good to go. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's presentation. My name's Dale Eisler, and I'm a senior policy policy fellow at the Johnson Shoyama, excuse me, graduate school. And I'm going to be the moderator and slash referee for today's uh, discussion. Uh, this is another in uh, the net zero carbon series organized by the Center for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy. Uh, the center is a joint initiative of the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. Its research is aimed at increasing understanding about the policy and governance dimensions of science and innovation policy. Uh, before we begin, uh, I want to acknowledge that while we're meeting here today in cyberspace, as they say, the Johnson Triama School physically is located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis people. Today's subject, as you all know, is reducing GHG emissions in the power sector. Our objective is to answer two questions. One is, uh, is a net zero power sector possible by 2050, which is our goal, hopefully? And if so, how do we get there? Uh, to help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off your videos if possible. It's not because we don't want to see your wonderful faces. It's just, I guess it takes up bandwidth, I'm told. Uh, so during the presentation, if you could stay muted um, and for the Q&A portion of our event, that would be good. Uh, the format uh, for today's panel is pretty standard. Each speaker, and we have three speakers, will have uh, 10 minutes to present. Uh, the speakers and I will then engage in a brief discussion after uh, we've heard their presentations. Uh, and then following that, we'll open it up to questions from everyone uh, to the panel. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please use the Zoom's chat function to send your question and you can just send it to me. And then during the Q&A, I will read out uh, uh, questions that have been submitted, as many as at least as uh, we possibly can get to over the course of the next hour and a half. Uh, if you have any logistical questions during the presentations, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster, who will be able to assist you on technical sorts of things. One other thing I'll mention is that this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the CSIP uh, website at a later date. So now, our speakers. Uh, first, Janice Dale, Associate Professor of Geology at the University of Regina. Uh, Dr. Dale's expertise is mainly in the field of geoscience, encompassing uh, and I might add words that I'd like to can't pronounce, geomorphology, soils and paleosols, quaternary and glacial sediments. Her current research includes a focus on the geological siting requirements of small, nuclear, small modular reactors and geothermal applications in southern Saskatchewan. Both those subjects, uh, small modular reactors and geothermal, is uh, very much... Uh, um, a part of the public discussion around uh, the climate change issue. In 2016, Dr. Dale was awarded a fellowship in Canadian Geoscience in recognition of her service to the Provincial and National Geoscience Board and Council. John McKenzie worked as a professional engineer for 40 years in the electric energy field. He also has an MBA in finance and government relations, a project man management mas master certificate, and is a graduate of the Richard Ivey Executive Program. During his electric, I almost said eclectic, his electric energy career, John worked extensively in transmission and distribution operations, senior leadership roles in power production and power system planning. Oscar Sigvaldison uh, is a professional engineer. Dr. Sigvaldison worked with Acres International, a global consulting engineering and management services company, with 1,500 employees for 38 years, including nine years as president. Most recently, he served as project manager for the Trottier Energy Futures Project, which sought to derive minimum cost solutions for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by up to 80% by 2050. Uh, and that's for all of Canada, that 80% reduction. He is a director of the Energy Council of Canada and a former member of the World Energy Council Studies Committee, He's a graduate of the University of Manitoba and Imperial College, University of London, and he followed that up by uh, postdoctoral studies in economics, environmental science, and systems methodology at Harvard University. 
So we're looking forward to an interesting and engaging discussion. And I'm pleased to turn the floor over to our spe first speaker, Dr. Sigvaldison. Doctor? Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, so um, my presentation will be built very much on the uh, work that was carried out uh, for the Talkie Energy Futures Project. And I have 11 slides, so I want to concentrate primarily on slide four and slide 11. So I'll be going through the rest of the presentation uh, quite quickly. So uh, next slide, please. So the uh, Trotty Energy Futures Project was funded by the Trotty Family Foundation in Montreal in 2010. And uh, in 2013, I was invited uh, on behalf of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and the David Suzuki Foundation to put together a uh, project methodology for this project. The goal, as you see here, is to define, to assess options and pathways for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. The report for this two and a half year project is titled there. Um, there's an executive and project summary report, and then there's a major report. And all of those uh, documents are publicly accessible. Next slide. So as noted, uh, this was funded by the Trottier Family Foundation in 2010. It's significant that this is right after the passage of the uh, Climate Change Act in the UK in 2008, uh, which had the same goal as for this project, 80% reduction by 2050 relative to 1990. As noted, it was co-sponsored by the two organizations and it was carried out over a two and a half year period. Next slide. So just want to spend a moment on this. Um, when I was asked to uh, take over the project in 2013, I was asked to define the approach and methodology to assemble a multidisciplinary team from across Canada and then to manage the project. So the approach and methodology is really a systems methodology approach using two mathematical models. The optimization model was um, a model that is, uh, is the, based on time smart health formulation and is coordinated globally by the International Energy Agency. It was especially important because this type of study had never been carried out in Canada uh, with the use of two uh, models. So it was especially important that all of the input to the models was peer reviewed. So, the data on, on energy, um, on electricity supply and delivery was peer reviewed by the Canadian Electricity Association and all of the input on the petrochemical side was, was uh, peer reviewed by CAF. We gave special attention to um, system dispatch challenges that were associated with uh, intermittent renewables, wind and solar, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, we carried out 11 scenarios and the goal of the project as laid out was to derive the minimum cost solution for all of Canada for the accumulated period from 2011 to 2015. Next slide. So Canada, as noted, was represented by its 13 jurisdictions, 10 provinces and three territories. The next slide. And in each, uh, in each uh, jurisdiction, we had a complete representation of the energy sector. Important to note here, it's the energy sector of which electricity is a part. But this slide, and I'm not going to go through this, but it basically is a whole supply chain from uh, production to uh, conversion facilities to end uses. So the for the models, everything was driven by end demands, which are the uh, five on the right hand side, which includes industrial, commercial, residential, transportation, and agriculture. The next slide. So during the course of the study, we um, analyzed, uh, we had 11 different scenarios. And um, again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but just uh, for appreciation, the uh, first eight scenarios were based on the um, projection by the National Energy Board. And then we decided that uh, the projections were probably on the high side, so we then did a series of additional runs using lower fossil fuel production uh, projection based on 
we used to use the fossil fuels in general. Uh, going vertically, we started with traditional technologies and then we added in what we call disruptive technologies such as second and third generation biofuels. We looked at the export into the US. We looked at a scenario in which there would be no additional nuclear generation. Uh, we looked at biojet fuels and uh, we also looked at the bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. We did include the coal uh, with carbon capture and storage. So next slide. Now this is a very key slide and there are three messages here. First of all, um, what is referred to as S1 is what we call the business as usual. We just pretend that uh, climate change is not an issue, so we just live with the current regulations, but no new regulation, no new policies. And so you see that the, uh, the, there's an increase in demand uh, from 2011 to 2050. So that's what's referred to as the S1 scenario. Um, it's interesting to note there that the that during this period of time from 2011 to 2050, we did uh, projections of increasing gross domestic product and showed that uh, using constant dollars that the size of the Canadian economy would grow by just over 100 percent from um, one and a half trillion in 2011 to just over three trillion. Remember, this is constant dollars, not inflated dollars. So the key thing here is that uh, while the economy is doubling, the demand for energy overall is increasing by about 60 percent, and that's for uh, the no action on carbon uh, uh, CO2 mitigation. The other four bars are a series of different scenarios which are really representative intended to represent extremes um, from um, from business as usual uh, technologies to uh, the addition of disruptive technology. So the second message here is that even though the economy is growing and the demand for energy services is growing, there is essentially no increase in the uh, demand for energy. So that was kind of a surprise. Uh, so that stays relatively constant. So that's the second message is that uh, when you add in the um, carbon um, emission constraints, it has, been, it has the effect of reducing the overall demand for energy. However, the third point, and this is the most critical point, is that the mix of energy changes really dramatically. Um, in 2011, the uh, end uses are 74% fossil fuels and its derivatives, 22% electricity and 4% uh, biomass biofuels. Uh, when we look at uh, by 2050, the role of uh, fossil fuels has reduced from 75% or 74% down to under 25%. And electricity has grown from 22% to uh, 60%. So it has actually tripled in terms of its role. And there's also an increase in, uh, in biofuels from 4% to around 15%. In this case, we also had some hydrogen that was coming in when all the other options were maxed out. Okay, next slide. So the principal observations, um, I've already covered that. Always the first priority is energy conservation, energy efficiency, the dramatic change in the mix of energy. Um, now the impact in terms of generating capacity in Canada, if Canada is really going to deliver on its um, THG mitigation commitments would mean that the capacity in Canada would have to increase from 135,000 to more than 500,000 megawatts, uh, more than tripling because all of your intermittent renewables need to be backed up with firm capacity. Um, decarbonized electricity supply came in as the early priority in all the sequences. Um, massive increase in high voltage interconnection between jurisdictions. The coal and bioenergy recovery capital and storage also came into the minimum cost solution, albeit late in the solution process. But our carbon sinks became really, really important. Next slide. Now we did some, uh, we've done some additional work for the governments of Ontario and Quebec. And uh, I just have added this because uh, those studies have in fact shown 
but the role of electricity becomes even more important because the difficulty we had in the in the Trotty was that uh, we had difficulty with options for heavy freight transport, but with the recent development of battery technology and fuel cell, that option now is viable. So this really means that the role of electricity is even more than what we had shown before. Um, so next slide. So this is the last slide. So um, first of all, just the drivers. What is driving uh, the solution for this? Um, we're looking at a threefold increase in both demand and supply of electricity. Um, future electricity generating systems will have to be non-emitting. Um, cost will be the dominant driver, but not the only driver. And then there's the question about social and political acceptability. Um, so if uh, for whatever reason you don't like nuclear, you, you may wind up with a more expensive solution and so on. So these are the considerations that come into the political process. So what does the composition of the future power system look like based on dominant consideration of uh, minimum cost? So uh, the first one is that wind and solar is, is your cheaper source of electricity, but it provides no dependable capacity. So the solution really shows that uh, we maximize the amount of wind and solar to the extent that the system can absorb it. So that, upper limit of the absorption is around 20 percent very system dependent it's higher in the hydro um, dominated system it's lower for systems that are dominated with baseload generation like nuclear and baseload thermal that are not able to cycle so the baseload generation uh, really comes from dominantly from three sources and that's the 80 percent which is hydro nuclear and then thermal with CCS, and there's some geothermal, obviously. Uh, high voltage grid interconnections is part of the minimum cost solutions. Um, with the increasing amount of intermittent renewables, you have to back that up. Recycling, but also with grid scale storage, which gives you a little bit of added capacity. You can add hydro at existing hydro sites because you'll be going from typically 70% capacity factor down to percent or less to complement the energy production from your intermittent renewables. Special attention to cycling. Facilities such as the AquaStore facility, uh, carbon capture and storage facility, will take a much greater value in the future, not only for the power sector, but for, but for other sectors. And then there are other considerations: rooftop solar for residential, commercial, and distributed energy systems need to be come into the solution process on a selective basis. So that's what a future system should look like, assuming that we're really serious about making the, the committed uh, commitment on GHG mitigation. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much, Oscar. That was uh, very interesting. That uh, work of the Troche Group Commission was, uh, was fascinating. OK, now I'll turn it over to uh, John McKenzie with his presentation. Then. You're on mute. Yeah, there you okay. go. There you go. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I'd like to share some uh, research work that uh, Dr. Margot Herbert and with uh, Jean Ackman Sell uh, were still undergoing. This we're half about halfway through this work, and uh, the purpose uh, today is to share what we found so far. Um, next slide, please. Uh, our objective today is to review the experience of the 10 focus groups that, the, that we've had so far. And each of those uh, workshops uh, were really <laughs> examining uh, individual preferences and also measuring them uh, for electrical energy supply as Saskatchewan moves forward to a, a low or zero emission energy framework. And sessions were held in Regina, Moose Jaw, Saskatoon, Estevan, uh, Weyburn, Yorkton, uh, LaRange, Prince Albert, Malfort, and Swift Current. Uh, lots of fun for me to go and meet all these folk. The number of attendees were uh, typically small, eight to nine, and they were really nice sessions. And in Regina, Moose Jaw, and Swift Current, 
uh, the sessions were quite a bit larger with uh, 18 to 30 folk. Next slide, please. The process that was used, uh, just in terms of Margot's research, uh, the participants were chosen using, using uh, random phone calls and advertisements, and there may have been different methods as well. Uh, on the phone, each participant answered a telephone survey about energy and their environmental preferences and knowledge. They were then invited to the face-to-face -face focus groups, which uh, in the locale close, closest to them, which I uh, facilitated. At each uh, focus group session, a presentation on climate change issues and, and then the state of planning of electricity in Saskatchewan was uh, covered. And uh, what did we tell them? Uh, we spoke about aspects of uh, climate change and regulation, the nature of the changing power system we spoke about quite a bit, the loss of coal as a generation source in Saskatchewan, the economic and non-emitting advantage of renewable generation sources such as wind and solar, and of course hydro as well, and the critical role of gas-fired generation to enable renewables. And that, that was, uh, uh, covered the existing system, the plans that SAS Power had were shared as well. The opportunity, there's an opportunity to replace coal-based uh, electric generation, the base load characteristic, with uh, non-emitting options. So we did two updates. Uh, one was a specific update on the work that's been done in Saskatchewan for nuclear generation and for uh, carbon capture and sequestration, sometimes known as clean coal. And that was, uh, most people found that interesting. There was lots of discussion in the groups. We put the uh, focus groups to work right after that, and they were asked to develop a pathway for zero carbon emissions, uh, examining the values, the actions, and accountabilities that would be required to be successful. And finally, we uh, had the group redo the original survey that they did at the beginning, and that is part of the research that Margo is working on, is, is changed uh, views. Next slide, please, Karen. So I'll just give you a bit of a big picture here. Uh, the primary audience uh, were involved in energy or farming, urban employment, government, media and academia. Um, there are a number of retired concerned citizens and the, the average age of the tendencies, uh, uh, the tendency, the attendees was over uh, 45 to 50 and, and higher. Within the group, there are strong, a few uh, strong climate change deniers and also individuals advocating strongly for climate change action. Though most would be described as concerned citizens wanting to understand how they can make uh, the future better for future generations. And that was a theme, future better for future generations, as I listened to folk. Areas such as Estevan, who currently are experiencing a major energy and economic downturn, showed great interest in nuclear power as an option, but also uh, spoke uh, strongly about the idea of uh, the province uh, making carbon capture and sequestration simply a larger part of the power portfolio to take advantage rather than throwing away the heritage coal reserves that exists in, in Estevan. Next slide, please. So once we got to work, uh, we had many, many answers and many sheets of paper filled in. So I tried to capture uh, them the best I could on a single slide. And um, from a value perspective, uh, almost everyone uh, took the perspective that uh, renewable and environmental leadership has to come first. Uh, there was comfort with that uh, amongst everyone, and including a priority on the development of wind and solar electricity generation. Um, Hydroelectric as well, but for uh, the folk there, wind and solar was uh, mostly the folk there. They were interested in seeing subsidies to aid in the development of newer technologies. Um, 
in the values embracing expert and fact-based help as opposed to um, simply preferences or even, even uh, uh, political linkages or leadership that is uh, driven by, by things other than fact. And, and um, with that help of expert uh, views, then what is possible is something that political leadership can grab hold of and move forward for. I sensed a strong trust for SAS power, but a deep, a deep frustration uh, in a lack of leadership on renewables and associated programs. And in particular, uh, what I heard was uh, the, the change in the net metering program and the values uh, really affected the plans of many of the people at the focus groups. There were people who were interested in these programs and very disappointed and uh, confused a little bit in terms of what SAS Power's direction is. All of the options uh, in terms of value must enhance the affordability and reliability of the power system. And there's a belief that home and business electricity conservation and waste is substantial and can be reduced. Next slide, please. Thanks, Karen. So in terms of the actions, um, the portfolio that uh, we had laid out in the presentation had a nice list of, of uh, of options that can be considered. And uh, what they identified in almost every uh, location that we went to was that there should be a portfolio approach to manage the risk so that uh, all the eggs aren't in one basket. Again, speaking to renewables first and then an economic allocation of the remaining um, uh, options. People were strongly interested in seeing education for uh, both students at schools and for people in positions of influence to ensure actions and leadership reflect the current issues and current thinking. And there was a uh, pushback on uh, the idea of imports from Manitoba. Um, fairly strongly, uh, people understood the idea of imports, but Strongly, they were worried about uh, capital funds and some of the work uh, really being carried out in Manitoba instead of uh, Saskatchewan. And there was a strong preference, if possible, to have uh, work built in Saskatchewan. Next slide. The accountabilities uh, was the shortest list. Um, they were looking for government to establish an appropriate policy framework and, and stay at that level and leadership in non-traditional portfolio pieces. So for example, a nuclear power was one that uh, we studied back in 2009, I believe, um, and we're looking at again, uh, it will take policy leadership to move uh, uh, small modular reactors for it. And I'll chat a little bit about that in, in a moment. Standards uh, are lacking in terms of setting up energy uh, conservation and in the avoidance of waste. So there's education part and standards piece associated with that. And they were really looking for corporations and um, stepping up and setting a societal example of leadership in areas that they're involved in. Uh, energy portfolios, uh, core competencies that they have and, and showing uh, great strength in that. And of course, individuals, uh, that each individual is accountable in how they choose their lifestyles and their own emission producing behaviors. Next slide, please. This slide here, uh, because we did a specific update on uh, nuclear power, it, it simply puts into um, context uh, the different sizes of, of nuclear options that can exist so if you if you go to the far right uh, the very large uh, uh, nuclear generating units uh, similar to Ontario where they have a large economy huge population centers um, Quebec and New Brunswick with a medium size and if you go to the far the far left, you have the micro-sized uh, uh, 
nuclear reactors, or, and you could call them small modular reactors, I guess, or research or to produce heat, uh, typically. Um, and then the ones that uh, in Saskatchewan that are really being looked at and imagined as being the small modular reactor portion or anywhere from 50 to 300 megawatts, um, which is similar to similar to the size of the uh, units, uh, the, the natural gas units and coal units that exist in, in the, uh, excuse me for that phone call. Um, smaller capacity reduces the risk uh, there's a lower capital cost, so again, there's a, a financial risk reduction. And modular construction is uh, very different from the field construction for power plants. And it uh, can create certainty, it can collapse the uh, issues around uh, regulatory inefficiencies. And, um, and should multiple or more than one kind of uh, uh, like beyond first of one kind uh, units, uh, it can reduce the project costs and risk in particular. These small modular that. reactors uh, being looked at across uh, uh, the world right now uh, have a strong, strong safety case. Next slide, please. Okay, John, we'll have to wrap it quickly here. Yeah. So, um, this was just a history of nuclear power in Saskatchewan in 2009. It was looked at closely, and then the conclusion was that it would be monitored. Um, one thing about these SMRs is that they're non-emitting. And then uh, finally, um, in terms of uh, every focus group, we had quite a, a sense of uh, strongly for and strongly against, and and a bunch of uh, other positions in between. Thank you, Dan. Good, thanks very much, John. Uh, Professor Dale. Okay. I'm just going to get my screen up here so that you can see this. And then I will continue on. So let me know if you can see this okay. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Let me get this going here. And I might just switch this around so that you can, is this, um, is this better? You can see the whole yeah. screen here? Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's good. well, th okay, good. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to talk about uh, some subjects that are near and dear to my heart. And uh, talking about the potential of low carbon, uh, low carbon alternatives in Saskatchewan. And Saskatchewan really is, has an embarrassment of riches. We have so many different options in this province in terms of reaching a low, common, uh, low carbon alternatives. So in the presentation today, I'm gonna to talk about um, geothermal opportunities in Saskatchewan. I'll talk about a case study in Saskatchewan looking at small modular reactors. And I'm going to start my presentation by talking about energy use in Canada because I think it's important to see just how we are using those energy sources that we require. So if you look at these two uh, diagrams, uh, this one is showing commercial and institutional energy use. You'll notice that roughly 63% of our use is made up of space heating, heating our atmosphere around us and heating the water. Similarly with residential, most of our energy requirements are being used to heat space and it's up to about 81% for space heating and heating our water. So I guess my, my question to you is, are there other ways that we can heat space and water without having to use electricity directly? Uh, can we integrate direct use energy sources into our energy mix? And in that discussion, I'm going to talk about two very low carbon emitters, uh, geothermal and nuclear. So I'm going to talk about three different uh, sort of types of industrial geothermal systems. Uh, and the first one is the ground source heat pump. And if you've ever talked to anyone in Saskatchewan and they say that they know someone who has a geothermal system on their property, this is what they're talking about. These are ground source heat pumps. And the way in which they work is that they take advantage of that differential temperature between the atmosphere and the ground. So for example, if we're looking uh, in the summer, we know we have very hot summers. Uh, we can heat air and water 
uh, and that can be taken down into the ground. The ground is comparatively cooler than the atmosphere and that cooled air water then can be repumped back into the building and supplying cooling. Conversely, in the winter time, uh, we do have very cold temperatures here in the winter. We can have a cold air and or water or fluids going down again, down into the ground. Often these are, are fairly shallow systems, maybe down to about 150 meters. Uh, comparatively speaking, the ground is warmer. And so that warm air or fluids then is pumped back up into the building and supplying heating. So this really is a, a shallow geo exchange system. It relies on that seasonal variations in, in the solar radiation. And we are already doing this in Saskatchewan. And of course, being in a temperate environment where we do have a very strong seasonal variations in temperature, um, it has a real opportunity for use here, particularly in Southern Saskatchewan. And I just put this up, I had an opportunity to go through a, a it's a five uh, towers uh, called the Hub in Waterloo, Ontario. And they are heating this entire complex using this geo exchange heating and cooling. And you notice that there is a dry area here and that's because they've got pipes that go underneath the concrete. And so even though there'd been a snowfall, wherever the pipes are, it's keeping this, uh, this sidewalk clear from snow. So these are uh, a direct way in which we can heat things without having to convert to electricity first. The next example is deep geothermal energy. And this is captured naturally uh, from hot water or steam or rocks. Um, we know that we have a geothermal gradient as you go from the outer crust and you move towards the core, the temperature becomes hotter. In Saskatchewan, that um, heat flux is approximately 25 to 30 degrees uh, Celsius increase for every kilometer that you go down. And so this is a natural system. It's supplying the, this heat all of the time. And if it heats steam or rock or water, and that can be brought up to the surface. And if it's hot enough, it can be used to produce steam, which can ultimately turn turbines and create electricity. Now, the exciting thing about this, of course, is that we have a, a group, the Deep Corporation, are developing the first geothermal power facility in all of Canada. And they want to establish long-term renewable baseload power in Saskatchewan. So thus far, they've drilled five wells. They've actually reached a, a record in terms of drilling about 3.7 kilometers. They've gone down to something called the Deadwood Aquifer, which is very high temperature waters in excess of 110 degrees uh, Celsius. And these hot waters will be brought up. And again, their hope is that they can produce a series of, of scalable, five to 20 megawatt power plants. And each one of these power plants could potentially heat 5,000 to 20,000 households. So this is a, a photograph showing that, uh, that deep uh, corporation, their drilling site, not a very small footprint on the land at all. And it is located west of Estevan, just north of the, the US Manitoba border. So this is indirect energy where we are using geothermal energy to create electricity. The third method using deep geothermal energy is when our resource is not as hot. So at lower temperatures, uh, heated water can be brought up from uh, an aquifer, in this case, the Deadwood Aquifer, can be brought up through a heat exchanger. That heat is transferred to surface waters that can then be piped um, throughout other buildings supplying radiant heating. And this is one of the projects that a group of us have been um, promoting on the University of Regina campus uh, to, uh, to have a, a geothermal heating system supplying heat and heating water. Now, this is a direct use. It is a proven technology. It has been used extensively throughout Europe for over 45 years. Um, here's a map just showing all these red areas on this map are showing where they are currently using geothermal reserves to uh, supply heating. Um, to date, France has over 90 of these geothermal district heating projects, and they started in 1969. And they are providing heating for as many as over 200,000 residential units. And they estimate that they probably saved about 650,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions equivalent, which is avoided annually. So they have reduced the amount of CO2 emissions that they have by using the system. 
And the system here is just showing a, a geothermal doublet uh, that's uh, been constructed in Paris, France. So when we look at all of Canada, everywhere where you see this blue color, this blue color is sedimentary basins. And these sedimentary basins have the right geology that can store enough water. And if this water is heated, it can be used for geothermal applications at the surface. So we have wide range area in, in not only the southern part of Saskatchewan, but also throughout Canada that could um, use geothermal opportunities. And I just wanted to mention, a lot of people might not know this, but the first geothermal exploration was actually back in 1979 on the University of Regina campus. Um, during that time, there were over 40 papers that were written, headed up by Lawrence Vigrass. And so we know that Southern Saskatchewan was ready uh, to utilize this kind of resource. And uh, this is showing the University of Regina campus back in 1979, the drill rig, and of course, the facilities management uh, power plant. So when we look at geothermal opportunities in Saskatchewan, most of the um, water, the geothermal resources are located uh, less than uh, 100 degrees Celsius. So these are low temperature applications. They can be used for direct heating. Uh, and so a large area of Southern Saskatchewan could utilize this resource. And if you notice here, this low temperature heating can be used to melt snow. Uh, I had an opportunity to go to um, Iceland and they're doing the same thing. They're, they've got all these pipes under their streets and of course they're melting the snow and uh, it means they don't have to use salt or gravel. They don't need to have as many uh, snow plows. Uh, it's been great from a safety standpoint, uh, fewer falls. But we can also use this heating for fish farms, heating swimming pools, uh, space heating, uh, heating greenhouses, and of course we saw with that uh, the heat pump that you can also do space cooling as well. Um, we also have towards the uh, southern part of the province near the U.S. border, our temperatures are high enough and that's where DEEP is going to be utilizing these temperatures to produce electricity. And uh, the other aspect, I just want to put this in, a colleague of mine went over to um, Greenland or sorry, over to uh, the Netherlands, where he was uh, looking at these greenhouses. This is an 18 acre tomato greenhouse complex. They have their own geothermal heating system and they're running this, uh, this uh, solar uh, greenhouses. Thank you. So um, now I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about small modular reactors. And um, John gave a very nice introduction to that. Um, but these small modular reactors, um, as we noted, are smaller than conventional reactors. Um, all the components are manufactured in a controlled factory environment. The fuel cells can be injected during manufacturing. They can be transported to a site on the back of a flatbed truck or by ship or rail. Um, SMRs can be built on the surface. They can be partially underground or completely underground. There are some designs for 100 meter depths. Uh, they don't take a large space, four to six hectares of space. And again, um, for our uh, thesis, we are looking at between 30 to 300 megawatts. And at 300 megawatts, we could supply um, power for 195,000 homes. So, I'm going to just talk very briefly about a project um, that I'm involved with, uh, started by uh, the engineering of Sam Hussain, uh, the Dean of Engineering, and we have the Fedoric Multidisciplinary SMR project. And um, to cut to the chase, what we're trying to find out is what do we need to know and understand in regards to the, the practicality of using small modular reactors? What are the environmental consequences what are some of the regulatory, the economic um, viability of introducing small modular reactors, nuclear power to basically a non-nuclear region? We have a wealth of uranium, but we don't use it ourselves. So our project is to develop site criteria for SMRs in Saskatchewan. And of course, I just put a picture here showing the wide variability um, of the conditions in Saskatchewan from north to south. There are six project areas in this project. There are 51 different research scientists, 14 different project, uh, project um, heads of these different projects, um, looking at everything from geographical and demography. And I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I just want to show you 
all the different aspects that we are looking at in terms of trying to determine the site criteria. Is it viable to have SMRs? And if so, where should they be placed? So um, we're looking at population density, the location of airports, transportation routes. My group, and I have two grad students, Amber Sprague and Matt Thompson, who are looking at foundation assessment, looking at the bedrock integrity and the impacts of sufficient materials. We have other people looking at the aquifers, groundwater, uh, et cetera. There's another whole group looking at the environmental implications, the greenhouse gas emissions, the amenability to evacuation. And I just wanted to put this in about, um, because it shows location. So I did my master's at McMaster University. Here is the campus. And in 1959, they built a nuclear research um, building. And so I spent uh, two years looking at this reactor. It's a five megawatt reactor. It's been there since 1959, right in the heart of the campus. So these things can be placed and placed safely. Uh, we also have people looking at the electrical grids, the load demand, uh, the availability of the grid, um, backup power. Other groups of, of researchers are looking at the regulatory aspects, refueling, emergency planning zones. And then finally, we have another group of lawyers that are looking at um, the legality of it, uh, the duty to consult and the risk of the source, uh, the reactor. So there are many different implications when one is trying to set up the criteria uh, for placement. And as I said, Saskatchewan is what we're using as our case study. Now, my last slide uh, that I want to show you right now is just um, some of the results of my student, uh, Amber Sprague. She's looking at the uh, bedrock conditions and she has divided up between natural phenomena and economic activity and she's creating these wonderful maps looking at the location. In this case you can see where there are faults in the bedrock. I'll point you out uh, to these red dots which are showing where we have had seismic activity. Uh, yes we have had earthquakes in Saskatchewan. Um, she's also looking at um, where there's oil and gas extraction and if they're using fracking and all of the implications that might have on where you place a small modular nuclear reactor. So this is an ongoing research. As I said, there are many researchers involved in this project uh, trying to look at this as a possibility of a low carbon source of power for our province. And uh, I'll stop it there. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Janice. And uh, people can start, uh, if you want to send in your questions, we'll get to them here very shortly. So feel free uh, to uh, ask questions. And maybe uh, just to get things rolling, I can kind of go back to our sort of objective at the outset. It's kind of the straightforward question of, uh, is net zero uh, possible in our electric sector uh, by 2050? We've uh, heard, you know, different mechanisms that can help us get us there. But uh, do you, each of you, I would be interested in you, is it, is it uh, reasonable and possible for us to be net zero by 2050? Maybe uh, who wants to start? Oscar, uh, do you want to start? You're on mute, Oscar. Am I on mute? Yeah, you were. So uh, am I still on mute? No, you're fine now. <laughs> so, uh, Canada at the present time uh, is already about 80% 80, uh, 80 emissions free, so it's, uh, it's a lot, lot further along than uh, virtually any other country in the world. But uh, in terms of getting to 100% emissions free, you have to go back and say, what does the composition look like? And uh, one of the concerns really is about thermal generation. Um, it's my belief that uh, thermal generation isn't going to disappear, but when it comes in, it has to come in with carbon capture and storage. And I think the Boundary Dam project uh, in Saskatchewan is really a landmark project, very, very important. Um, I think we need to look at uh, that type of technology also for uh, gas, uh, natural gas with the carbon capture and storage. But the, uh, I think you can get to uh, uh, at Boundary Dam, they were able to get to 90% um, reduction in GHG emissions, so there's still 10% that's being emitted. Now, I know that at the, uh, at the CCS Innovation Center, at the, at the campus there, 
but they're looking at how to reduce the parasitic losses and the amount of CO2 emissions down to something less than 10%. Uh, they'll never get to zero. So I think we're always going to be saddled with a certain amount of emissions, but we'll get very close to zero. And I think um, the power sector is actually in a better position to get to uh, close to zero than virtually every, any other sector of society. So I think you're on mute, Dale. <laughs> Sorry, Janice, uh, briefly, and then John. Okay, um, well, I guess, uh, I mean, reaching an absolute zero, I'm, I'm a scientist, I never like to say absolutely, but I think we can certainly get very close. And I think that Saskatchewan, again, we have so many different options here in this province that we can certainly move in that direction to reducing our emissions a great deal. I mean, right now, I think we're about the top in terms of per capita greenhouse gas emissions in, in all of Canada. And, uh, and so certainly we, we've got some work to do there that we need to, to be addressing. But we've got, you know, I mean, we're the solar capital of Canada and we've got geothermal resources. And we've got the uranium, I mean, wind, we, we've got it all. And I think it's a matter of us choosing uh, and perhaps diversifying what our, um, diversifying those and, and choosing okay. what is the best option for a given place. Okay, John, do you think it's doable? I think uh, we can, Come very close to it, um, not not perfection. We will need uh, um, gas, natural gas-fired electric generation to um, uh, to operate and to uh, allow the operating reserve to occur for for renewables. That's what it does. In addition to base load parts, but there is a lot of potential with nuclear to have a non-emitting option if. Uh, clean coal can be made more economic. Uh, that's another contribution there. As right. well. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a question here where there, the questions are coming in. So uh, this kind of points us to 2030 instead of 2050. And the question is, given the climate crisis, we have to be net negative before 2050. Does some of this research indicate if we can reach it using technolo technological advances in renewables before 2030? So is, uh, I mean, is this, can we advance this uh, to, you know, reach our goal before 2050? Well, that's a, that's a good question. A lot of people are asking whether or not we can uh, actually deliver on 2030, which is 30% reduction relative to uh, 2005. At the present time, we're um, actually uh, above 2000 or just, just at 2005. So there's a lot that has to happen between now and 2030. Um, the power sector, uh, there can be advances, but the problem with power sector projects is that they take a long time to go through the uh, approval process and the construction process and so on. So if you wanted to do this with nuclear, there's no way that you could bring a nuclear project online before 2030. Uh, you may be able to bring uh, the coal, uh, natural gas with CCS, Assuming that that's a viable uh, and cost competitive option, maybe I'll bring that ahead in stages, but um, it's a real challenge. There's uh, increasing skepticism that uh, Canada is also going to miss its 2030 targets. Okay, uh, there's another question here I'll ask because we've got a lot today, uh, and maybe I'll direct this one to, uh, uh, well, maybe John, because you, you were involved in some of the focus grouping. Question is, has anyone assessed the impact that will result from green jobs as we try to achieve this goal? That is more work on residential and industrial, uh, uh, which will generate lots of jobs. I haven't been involved in any uh, job studies or economic studies for that, but it's, uh, it's intuitive that, um, that as uh, we become more comfortable with the, uh, with with the clean options that there be a manufacturing uh, impact and jobs associated with that. Um, there will be losses of jobs uh, associated with the loss of coal in places like Estevan. Um, and of course, uh, uh, that balance is a question, you know, so, so you yeah. know, 
those. How that modeling might work out would be interesting. Okay, I have a question here for Janice. And is the question is, is there any opportunity to look at site selection for a small modular reactor to support industry growth in northern Saskatchewan? So given the fact that these are are mobile and, and, and can be moved to uh, sites where necessary. Has there been any uh, work done on site selection in the north or is it too early for that? Well, I, I know that that was one of the, you know, one of the, the, the possibilities in, in doing this project. We've used Saskatchewan as our case study. Um, we had to, to sort of shorten our geological area because it was just so complicated, but certainly we would be interested in looking at the northern areas. And there has been interest in perhaps some of the, you know, the uranium mines themselves could be using a very small modular reactor to power their mines instead of the ways they're doing them now. And certainly it's, uh, I know there are uh, some groups that have heard they're looking at sort of more remote locations in the northern Arctic. So we're hoping that with what we learn here in Saskatchewan that we could use that and broaden that out to other areas. Okay, and here's a kind of a related question. And uh, maybe Oscar, you might want to uh, consider this one. Uh, it's the question, my understanding is that uh, G4, generation four, I guess that is, uh, SMRs are more or less still on the drawing board. So in other words, a long ways away from, from applicability. And then given the urgency provided by the IPCC in terms of climate change on the need to start lowering emissions like now, uh, why are SMRs still in the mix given that they are, you know, in a regulatory sense, still a long ways off? Oscar, do you have comments on that? Yeah, I have a couple of comments on that. First of all, um, there's, a, there's sort of a dilemma between SMRs and the large nuclear reactors, because when you're looking at uh, tripling the amount of supply, um, and that's obviously contingent on being serious about meeting your uh, 2050 targets, um, you're not going to do that with SMRs. You're going to do that with the large nuclear reactors because they're they're less expensive on a per uh, kilowatt basis than uh, than the uh, SMRs. So that's one comment. So the the um, the other comment I wanted to make is that uh, in the nuclear industry, and I have a lot of discussions with uh, Jim Berkeley on that who's the chair of the uh, Nuclear Association, um, is that the nuclear industry, the engineering for nuclear reactors is a very time consuming process. And some of the errors that have been made in recent times have been to initiate construction on nuclear reactors before the engineering gets completed. The, um, the problems that are, that are being experienced on the Volga project in, in Georgia uh, which has now led to a cost of $25 billion, uh, it's horrendous. So just, it is so important to do the engineering and do it completely before you go to construction and construction takes long. So the earliest that you could really bring in a nuclear reactor is probably 15 years plus at this stage. 15 years? 15, yes. Yeah, are you talking about like a full-scale nuclear reactor or SMR? Well, both. Both, yeah. 15 years. Wow. Because they, there's still a lot of engineering to be done with the SMRs as well. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I, if, if I can just sort of address that question as well. I mean, it, it is a, 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 you know, a very new technology. We've learned a lot from those large nuclear reactors, um, but there's jurisdictions all around the globe that are looking into creating and making and designing these small modular reactors. My understanding is that Russia has, has made one design and that they've actually input it and put it on barges that, they're say, that they have. Uh, so rather than having the small modular reactor on land, they've got it on a barge. And that in fact, that they've actually started construction and work on this. And so I think that we might, in the 15 years, we might be able to use the technology and expertise from other areas to speed that up in our own areas. So I think it's very exciting. And there's areas certainly down in the States, in Idaho, there's a group down there. And again, it's been very expensive, billions of dollars, but they've learned a lot about how to create and, and make these modular facilities. So we're learning something all the time. So 
Um, I think that's one of the one of the one of the beauties of living in Saskatchewan is that we can be phasing different things in uh, to achieve an ultimate goal of, of you know as close to zero as we can get. But in the meantime, we can look at some of these other opportunities like geothermal, um, you know, maybe supplying heat that would would directly start to reduce our carbon emissions. And they, those could be done relatively quickly because, you know, we already have the technology and we know the geology is sound. Okay, good. John, Thanks, John, yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, John. I have a question for you too, John. Go ahead. Uh, just on that same uh, issue of time around SMRs, um, if you look to the United States, there were uh, two groups. Uh, one, a new scale power, which mm -hmm. has uh, really moved towards a regulatory assessment of their designs, uh, a, a fair degree in the United States. And um, that size would be anywhere from uh, 45 to uh, multiple units up to, you know, 400 megawatts might be a size. I think a, a unit that has advanced that far, and it's, it's not a generation four, it's a generation three and a half, say. Um, 10 years is not unreasonable at all. And um, though all, all the issues that Oscar mentioned, the, uh, uh, the regulatory challenges, certainly the Canadian uh, nuclear uh, industry don't have a, you know, an SMR on the, uh, on the block right now to sell. So, uh, so there, are, there are units available that are at the power scale that could be done 10, 12 years, I think. Okay. Uh, so, John, this is for you too, because uh, you were involved in the, uh, the focus groups and, the, and you brought up the subject of uh, power for Manitoba and, and the public reaction to that. And the question is, couldn't hydro from uh, Manitoba offset the need for natural gas as a backup, as a renewable backup for... Uh, for electricity production here? Uh, absolutely, it could be a resource uh, used for that. Um, though the, um, the, the choices that they make often are economic, say, versus technical when they get into, you know, an import situation. And it depends very much on how uh, Manitoba is prepared to sell a block of energy as well. Right, okay. Uh, uh, here's Jill, could I just add yeah. a comment on that? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, really attractive things about uh, hydro is that it complements wind and solar because it has low solar capability that is uh, certainly better than anything other than uh, maybe uh, natural gas turbines. They can blow solar as well, but not as well. So there's a real opportunity to use Manitoba hydro, hydro to increase the potential for increased uh, installation of wind and solar in Saskatchewan. To uh, better interconnections. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, here's another uh, question. Um, there seems to be two streams of possibilities. One is a diverse mixture of, of zero emission, small scale technologies, uh, wind, solar, waste to energy, geothermal, etc. cetera. Uh, the other is nuclear. What factors should decide Saskatchewan's pathway? Nuclear is expensive and will take a great deal of time, as we just uh, were talking about. We can start uh, the mixed approach now. So it's, I guess, the question of pathways going forward. And uh, anybody would like to take a crack at that? I don't think these, uh, these pathways are mutually exclusive. Um, I think they're, they're pathways that can be done in parallel. And the factors, uh, say, associated with nuclear, nuclear has struggled where, uh, where they've gotten into uh, risk associated with con construction uh, uh, pathways uh, that ended up being very expensive and economically risky. If they can, uh, I, th I think when we move forward, looking at nuclear, it has to be uh, driven by business. It has to be uh, driven by uh, avoiding risk, and that might mean uh, consortiums uh, that, that can eliminate the first of kind risk, which is typically the, the biggest risk you run into, uh, because often they only build one or two of a, a particular kind of, of, of a nuclear reactor. And, and I think that as uh, the industry realizes that it's not technology, it's business that's going to determine the outcome here. 
that, that they'll have to really look at that uh, with a, a tough eye. So okay. I would just add, uh, with, uh, add to John's comment that uh, I think you need both. Um, certainly when you're looking at uh, building up uh, going from 135,000 megawatts to uh, five or 600,000 megawatts, you're going to have to go with very large uh, grid scale developments, but that does not uh, stop you from taking advantage of small technologies that are primarily in the residential and commercial sectors and uh, to, to a, a limited extent also in the industrial sector. So you, I think you need to do both because there's some really interesting technologies for the residential and commercial sector that can take advantage of the, the low capacity factor of demand in those sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, Janice, any comment? Yeah, I mean, I think diversification is the way to go. I think that, uh, you know, we, we are so dependent on one or two different sources when in fact we've got so many we can utilize. And, and that's the idea of setting up some of these, you know, determining the criteria for the SMRs. It may be that it, it's not feasible in certain areas in Saskatchewan and that, you know, that solar and, and geothermal <coughs> would be a much better um, option. So I, I guess from my standpoint, I'd like to see um, us moving in many different directions and but doing it in a very um doing it in in, in a sort of in a planned way that we're not just sort of trying this and this here and there that we're actually thinking about what is the best system to use in this spot and in this area and what are our needs what is it that we really need is it for heating is it can we get heating directly do we need it to, for electricity i mean i think these are the questions that we have to start asking and, and from my standpoint, I know business has to be involved in it, but I think we need to, to see increased uh, leadership from the government. And we're starting to see that now where they're starting to, uh, to look at opportunities and providing opportunities to try some of these new technologies and see what works. Yeah, so it's kind of a case of all of the above. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, yeah. Right. and I mean, Saskatchewan has so much. I mean, we're, we're already starting with the solar arrays, but I mean, I guess I've got this dream that here we could use geothermal to heat greenhouses. We are the solar capital of Canada. We've got a transportation hub right outside of Regina. And, and of course, we're sort of in the center of North America. I mean, if someone had lots of money, they could, they could set up a, an amazing sort of uh, uh, market gardening type of business. Uh, yeah, so there's think, a, there's you know, a, I read recently about the, a guy in Nebraska mm -hmm. who has used geothermal for a, for a market garden uh, yeah. down there on a small scale, but interesting. Here's another question. Um, compressed air energy storage technology has great potential application in Saskatchewan as it is able to convert intermittent renewable generation like wind and solar to emulate firm or dispatchable capacity. Is this technology being considered in Saskatchewan's transition pathway. Anybody willing to well, take a stab I, at that? I, I, can, I can start on that because uh, for, for, for many, many years, uh, compressed air energy storage was always looked upon as an alternative to uh, large grid scale pump storage. <clears throat> um, to the best of my knowledge, there's only one compressed air storage facility in the world, and that's in Germany. Um, but the Difficulty with compressed air energy storage is that you need uh, natural gas generation as the primary energy source. So that's why it, it emits uh, greenhouse gases. So that's why it has uh, sort, of, sort of fallen off the table as really being a, a viable option. And we did look at it in the Tantier work and did not include it because uh, we knew that it would not come in into the solution process. Maybe, Oscar, you could explain what it is, because I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. Well, compressed air energy storage is really taking uh, energy out of the grid to drive combustion turbines that then compress air, and the air is stored in underground caverns. And then, oh. the, then the air is, uh, during peak demand periods, then you can bring out the compressed air um, to drive your combustion turbines remembering that uh, you can then triple the output from the combustion turbines because when you have combustion turbines um, a third two-thirds of the energy is lost in the in the compression cycle so this is a way of recapturing the energy and getting more electricity production from the combustion turbines 
So maybe John, you may wish to add to that. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit to it. Um, you know, there's uh, power markets between jurisdictions uh, is one application uh, for compressed air energy storage and that at a border, uh, that device, uh, which is basically a large battery in a way, when you think about it, um, can um, allow you to shift time with energy and thus the value. Okay, so that's one application. There's a technical application which you could use to um, enable uh, renewables, uh, uh, wind, and, and the regulation associated with that, and that would work fine. It would all come down to the economics. Now that gets looked at uh, every so many years. There's uh, a number of folk who have uh, approached uh, SAS Power to talk to them about that, and I'm, I'm not sure what the state of it is right now, but once in a while it's there's there's folk trying to uh, sell it, right, as, a, as an okay. option. Okay. Um Another question here, uh, a kilowatt hour uh, comparison between wind solar paired with batteries and lignite generation, coal generation paired with uh, carbon capture and SMRs. So the, I guess the power production comparison between those, those options, is that, I th hope I'm interpreting that correctly. Anybody? Oscar? Uh so, uh, you know, certainly in the residential sector, um, solar with battery storage um, is an option. Um, that also gets into the question about uh, whether, you're not, whether or not you're connected to the grid and you have to pay for the connection to the grid. That's, uh, that's the big uh, dilemma with that. I know Manitoba Hydro has dealt with that in terms of uh, allowing for that sort of pricing but uh, making sure that uh, that they're not paying for, uh, they're only paying for the energy. So, uh, so that's uh, the way you look at it, let's say in the residential commercial sector where you're really looking at small scale generation. When you're looking at grid scale, um, you know, for base load and um, high capacity factor load cycling, um, then you've got to go to the, um, to those generating options that uh, can operate at very high capacity factor. That's where solar with battery simply can't operate. So, you know, they have, uh, as John has said previously, um, they have different roles depending on where in the system they're, they're operating. Okay. Um, here's a, a comment more than a question. Billions of dollars can be put into technologies, that'd be new technologies, I, I assume, in a place of, uh, other than uh, SMRs. And, you know, areas like geothermal, solar and wind, we could put uh, all kinds of money into that, rather than into SMRs, which as we've noted, are somewhere off in the distance. Um, thoughts on that, that in terms of the efficient use of scarce public resources, that uh, we should be putting money into technologies that are relatively proven at this point and know can uh, can address the emissions issue. So uh, it's you know it's a question of uh, you know yeah. policy yeah. question of where you should you should allocate resources. Maybe Janice, do you want to? Yeah, wanna... I mean I I mean that's a that's a great question and and I mean it's it's. Uh, yeah, certainly one that, um, I mean, that's where I think we're looking for, you know, our governments and uh, for some leadership in that direction. I mean, I'm very happy to see that, that we're starting to put money into developing, you know, geothermal, um, that at the Deep Corporation got a lot of funding from um, the federal government to put this project forward. And so um, I, I think that it, it, it is important that we do have research funds available for some of these projects. And, and you're right, I mean, some of these things are off the shelf. I mean, you could do district heating relatively simply um, because uh, we do have the technology. Uh, but but one, of the, one of the issues, or just a side issue here is, is the fact that, you know, some technologies are, are better able to get funds than other technologies. And certainly geothermal has had a long history of having a, having a tough time getting uh, financing. Um, and, uh, and so um, 
that 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 has certainly slowed the 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 growth of that industry in Canada. Whereas if you look globally, there are certainly areas uh, all over the the globe that are that are using geothermal very effectively. But we we simply have not put the funds into it in this country to um, you know to promote it and to get some of these other aspects going. So I'd like to see more leadership and and funding for these other sources. Yeah, but how expensive is geothermal? Just well, sorry, Oscar. I'm just yeah, curious I mean, about the cost of geothermal. Yeah. yeah, well, we we put together an estimate, to, and it's including a million dollars for research, but we put together an estimate um, to supply district heating uh, on the University of Regina campus for about $16 million. You would have the whole thing. That includes drilling, it includes infrastructure, putting in the lines and everything, and it would... It would uh, it would uh, join directly with the new Kizik towers um, because they use radiant heating um, and it would also supply heat in the facilities and we wouldn't have to build a new building there's space right in uh, you know the, the 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 energy plant on campus there's space there we could drill it um, it would uh, wouldn't take up any space at all uh, I mean you can't even see where the old drill site was in the parking lot um, and so when you think of $16 million in the vast scheme of things, it's, it's, uh, it's not a lot of money when you're thinking about billions in some of these other systems. So for some reason, we just, we just seem to be hesitant. There doesn't seem to be a will to do that. Uh, I mean, geothermal has been expensive in the past, but when you look at it from the standpoint that these systems, um, they have the highest capacity rating of any of the, of the green energy sources. It's a well over 90% of the time these systems were, you know, 300, 365 days of the year, 24 hours a day. Um, and then you, you, you couple that with, with uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, it's going to be around for 65, 70 years. Um, and so these systems, uh, the geothermal systems and, and other systems as well, I mean, you're not talking about a, a plant that maybe lasts 25 years. You're talking about something that will last for maybe a couple of generations. Um, and we figured out that if they had finished uh, the installation at the University of Regina campus, they would have saved about $9.5 million just in, in paying for gas uh, in Eric. their buildings. So um, again, I think a lot of it comes down to will. Um, we have to want to do this. Okay, Oscar, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. <clears throat> uh, one of the challenges today is that uh, planning of energy systems has become far more complicated um, relative to the way it used to be. The utilities like Sask Power and Manitoba Hydro and so on, they used to do their planning on the basis of uh, just demand projections. Uh, the mix stayed pretty constant, and uh, so they would then go through a process of just uh, dividing minimum cost solutions, and that would set the stage for their investment program. Now, the complication is that uh, you can't design an electricity supply system in isolation because it's so highly integrated with strategies for um, uh, GHG mitigation and industrial development and so on. So the question then is uh, that the, the role of the importance of planning hasn't disappeared. The problem is that there are less organizations that are actually doing the planning simply because it's uh, interministerial, it's interjurisdictional and, and so on. So it is really important that the planning take place and that uh, all of the technologies that are being considered be in that mix and then to look at which are the most promising technologies. And that is not only on the supply side, it's all of, also on the demand side, on the conversion side and so on. So um, this is an area that, uh, that needs to be given more attention so that uh, governments are allocating scarce financial resources to those types of research projects that have the greatest promise, not necessarily only the ones with the greatest promise, but uh, you have to keep looking at the outliers as well. So there is a there is a, a whole philosophy here of how do you do this that needs to be uh, given much more serious consideration. Okay, uh, I have a question here. To what extent is Saskatchewan constrained in meeting a net zero by 2050 target by its limited interconnection to renewable sources elsewhere in Western North America, or in other words, by insisting on a provincially owned electricity supply. This has been a long uh, time issue. I remember back in the days of Sterling Lyon when he was uh, Premier of Manitoba used to be promoting the Western power grid. 
right. uh, uh, to uh, his uh, counterparts in the West. And of course, none of the other provinces wanted to play along because they all had their own provincial uh, utilities. Uh, so how constrained are we by this bias towards uh, uh, you know, our own utilities? Uh, I'll speak. To John, that. yeah, John, that would be good for you. Uh, we have interconnections, uh, east, west, and so. And um, those interconnections are based on reliability and commercial reasons, right? Um, every uh, group, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and through the planning group in Alberta, um, plan on their own for their province. Right. So they're, they're, and they also plan for the case of an emergency if they need it. Um, issues like the Western Grid, and there have been different names for it, uh, have been put forth. And there's uh, lots of benefits. And in the end, uh, they've um, not been moved forward largely because of economics. Um, no, there's lots of benefits. And I, I think that uh, years ago, Oscar and I were chatting about uh, the potential for a large hydro in different jurisdictions combined with renewables, um, if it were planned in a multi-jurisdictional basis to have a lot of potential to, to help in this. So the uh, bottom line for that is it requires uh, policy will to do that, someone will have to spend some money because it's uh, it's uh, it's not something that unfolds in the day to day economics either. Yeah, well, I recall a number of years back um, there was serious talk, and maybe John, you were around at SAS Power at the time uh, between Saskatchewan and Manitoba about the potential merger of SAS Power and Ontario and Manitoba Hydro and SAS-TEL and Manitoba-TEL would be kind of a trade-off where, if I remember correctly, SAS, uh, SAS power would kind of be swallowed by uh, Manitoba Hydro and vice versa in terms of SAS-TEL and Manitoba-TEL. I'm not sure if any formal studies went on on that, but I recall numbers being done on it roughly. And, um, and, and Manitoba Hydro is much larger than uh, SAS power. But SAS Power is a very well-run business, and, and the debt to equity is, uh, is not bad. Uh, so when you add up the economics and the assets, it, it, it ends up being uh, fairly close to equal. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe one more uh, question that we're going to have to... Uh, then you, you folks can give a, a one-minute wrap-up comment. Here's the question. It says, who are the leaders? We say, uh, we say it's the government, and it's clear the federal government has taken certain actions that are, uh, this person's word, unfavorable, brackets, carbon tax. I don't know if that's unfavorable or not. Maybe unpopular with some people. Um, so is it the province uh, or SAS power? Who, and in terms of the geothermal, uh, Janice, who, decide, who pays for the uh, 16 million for the U of R? Uh, do students pay for that? Where does it come from? Well, this is, this is the point that we're at, um, you know, trying to, uh, to see what sources uh, and what interest there is. I mean, certainly the, the federal government has a number of different initiatives. Um, what, and so we've been looking into that. So a lot of it would come from funding from the government, both uh, the provincial as well as the federal government. And uh, one of the, again, one of the issues we ran into was that some of the uh, initiatives they had were primarily for energy development and of course building a system on campus would not be producing electricity and energy we would be producing heat so it sort of put us out of the running in that point but I think in terms of funding I think we're, we're looking for uh, for sort of government support for this okay and, and again leadership from you know in particular our, our you know our federal government as well as as our provincial government in moving forward in this and seeing the benefits of this long term Okay. Well, listen, we're almost at the end of our time. Uh, maybe uh, I turn to each of you and just very briefly, a few very quick concluding comment. We've got like uh, less than two minutes here. So uh, Janice, then John and Oscar. Okay. I guess, I guess I'd like to just leave people with a couple of things. And I, I think it follows along with what we've been talking about. Uh, and one thing I guess to, to say is that at, you know, at present, we don't have a perfect 
power source. There is no silver bullet that's going to be saving us or reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are pros and cons with all of our different energy sources at present. Um, and so I think that this is an opportunity for innovation and, and trying to move forward and find uh, solutions to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Part of that, of course, is developing criteria to help us choose what is the best system for a given location. So rather than the one size fits all, maybe we need to be more strategic and think about what would be the best thing to use, say, in a northern community compared to what would be the best type of power source in Estevan. And then the final uh, point I want to make was just about diversifying our power sources. Um, I think that maybe we need to give people more encouragement to use solar energy to develop or use, uh, you know, the, the, the heat pumps. And right now, I don't think that there is a lot of encouragement for people to do that. And it would okay. be nice to see more encouragement. And okay. maybe we need to think of smaller scale rather than these great big systems that, uh, that we've developed in the past. Start thinking smaller scale. Okay, John? Uh, I was thinking uh, we're in a transition space these days in terms of planning the power system. And um, if you have the list of things that we need to do for renewables, uh, it, it's very uh, known, it's very known, um, uh, wind, solar, uh, conservation, um, but more than that, uh, I think people, and I think it's logical too, is that um, it will require some help to take uh, some of the technologies out of the, what I call the subsidy space into the, in the money space. And that, that requires uh, programs not unlike the net metering program to cause that to happen. Um, when it comes to uh, the big steps, the bold steps uh, like nuclear, and in the past, uh, carbon capture and sequestration was a bold step for our province to undertake that project by our, by our political leadership took that, uh, took that uh, big step though. Um, but that's a that's a key building block for looking to the future. Nuclear would be the same way, is that if if we were ever going to go in that direction, it would require a strong political leadership. And um, if we're not going to go in that direction, then uh, it helps uh, the planners to be able to just focus on the things that the tools that they have. Okay, thank you, John. Oscar, you can wrap it up. Okay. Just, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments. One is that, uh, and I've already done that, uh, is to emphasize the importance of planning um, that fully integrates uh, economic development with GHG mitigation and the transformation of energy systems. And the planning needs to be, uh, you know, first of all, designing pathways and then having strategies and then finally addressing the policy options of which carbon pricing is one. But uh, not everything is going to be solved with uh, carbon pricing. So, uh, and that's a process that has to be fully integrated between the provinces and the federal government. I still believe that the, uh, that the federal government needs to eliminate this as being a partisan politics issue, that they need to be working together as has been accomplished in the UK and in Sweden. So that's the first comment I want to make. The second is that it's really important for the people of Saskatchewan to understand the tremendous contribution from the Boundary Dam project and particularly from uh, the development of carbon capture and storage. That's a huge, huge uh, success. Uh, I know there's been some criticism of that, but when we look at uh, electricity supply worldwide, two thirds of the electricity is from uh, fossil fire generation. And in the long term, uh, that fossil fire generation is going to require carbon capture and storage. So this yeah. is a huge plus for Saskatchewan. Right, agreed. So those are my two comments. Okay, well, no question that uh, carbon capture is going to be part of the global solution to climate change. There's no way around that, uh, as you've indicated. Well, I want to thank our panelists and everybody for uh, joining uh, in the discussion today. And maybe I could propose that in 2050, we reconvene to see if we've reached our targets. Uh, You've got a date. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, the same date, whatever date of May, what is it, May 12th in 2050. We'll, uh, and we'll have the, uh, the transcript from today to look at to see how uh, prescient we all were. 
Yes. At any rate. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, uh, keep well in these strange days that we live in. And uh, uh, we appreciate everybody taking part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.